And we're all here. Uh, both Olivia and Dr. Travis are not going to be able to join us today. So I don't know if you saw my email, but based on your comment this morning, and then Judy just sent me an email like 15 minutes ago. Uh -huh. I just held back on that one. Well, I just wrote. I, like, I just drew a line through. Okay. I drew a line yeah. through the sentence. I had to make okay, three cool. That was the only one. Any other one? I, I don't remember that. Like, that's fine. Cool. Cool. I didn't get a chance to respond. So I, 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 I put it. I just used my well, pen to mark it on here. Okay. And then if you guys find out well, later that it's, it is going to be okay. Yeah. We could probably maybe re we'll see what they say about it, but I mean, we could probably reword it in such a way that, again, we have to cordon off the difference between a contractual limit versus an academic limit. Right, right. And the only thing is that the catalog is nice, has that table. It does feel different than this. Like, they bring completely It's just such a strong statement. Right, right. Strong, explicit statement that that is. Right. I would uh, hate for someone to walk into their advisor and get into it. Right, right. Yeah, it says, I'm going to try to get into it. Yeah, exactly. It's just a term. Yeah. Like, the computer is in their stock. Oh, yeah. Did you see what you see right there? So, there's anything to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Robert, really good. Hold on. Actually, that's really good. I love your friends, bro. They're all so funny. I made a note stop for today. That's fine. I sent a link in this but it's in the same place. I mean, that's the one that I really want to make sure that you look at. I mean, everybody else is okay, but so it's just here. I've got a paper copy. No, I'll put it in the green chat. Just like, and there's a my homestead exemption is not going to be valuable. It's not going to help us. By the way, if you haven't been to the Alaska County property appraiser, as far as public buildings go, it's very pleasant. It's not very nice. They're very helpful. They're very efficient. They're not like any of the public buildings. Yeah, not like any of the public buildings. Because I just moved it there. Like today, it's due tomorrow. They have extended hours tonight. They're open till seven. Yeah, you got to fill out the transfer form. There's a form online, but you need your warranty to get from the closing documents. I just went through like I talked to you about how to do it. Because I literally just did it two days ago. It was much more complicated than I thought. I have all the, I actually have a copy of the form, so I can show you exactly what it looks like. And I actually have, like, right after this meeting, I have a half an hour. Oh. But the point is, for the time, no, I okay. should have gotten to that and had those comments. And that's fine. Way no, I, that's fine. I know, I know, so I know everybody's I, busy. I know, but I, I'm sensitive to your work. I'm yeah, sorry. no, that's okay. If it, how about this? If it, if it required me to add something, yeah. I would just pull the article. Yeah, but the fact that I can just cross out a line, like, like we can still go ahead. All the solidarity. <laughs> I was kind of tracking them as they came in, but I set aside an hour this morning. And I well, it's also, them all, and then I'm like, <sighs> it's also different for me because I try to set aside like three and four hour blocks of time on Monday and Tuesday to yeah. just get yeah. in and write. Right. And you guys don't have that. You guys don't have that time. So then by the time I get to them, it's normally Tuesday afternoon. Right. And then you have like 24 hours. Um, I think we're we're ready. You guys yeah, good? Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Let me go ahead and <laughs> just back in with the way now. Yeah, I'll just back in with the <laughs> So I will say that you're gonna, some of the formatting on some of these has gotten nice. even worse, really bad. Mm -hmm. I think at one point, I don't know if it was you or us, put it into a Google Doc and then like downloaded it perhaps. So it got all okay. kinds of well, we do use like Google. super wonky. Yeah, but, a lot of editing is done in there. So that's definitely but, Yeah, but they edit as DocX. Yeah. It's might not keep the history properly or something. Like that. I mean, yeah. the formatting was already bad. Oh, it's yeah. like I said, when we're done, I'm just going to yeah. literally just retype the whole thing from scratch. Right. Yeah. So, Brandon, Austin, Jacob. And this is a little bit. Do you want me to email it to Cassandra too? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. C U R B E N Z, right? Yep. At UFL. Okay. Yeah, I, I can hear you.
I got an extension for this week, so I'm worried about my laptop guy. I tried that. You know, I'm not that. <laughs> but here's gets slow, we can always trade off. I'll have to leave. I don't think they're late anyway, so. My department always has a blue cream at 3 o'clock on Thursdays, and then if we're in the program, we can just walk down the hall this week. That's part of the Walker Institute. They have our desk speakers, so we're still that. Oh. So I can walk to G330 instead of G330. Mm -hmm. Yeah, notes. Right. I'm holding the gap. Sure. Yeah. All right. So I think I think we have four, five, six, seven, thirteen, and twenty-one. Is if we can get through all that, great. I think that's what we have for you guys today. Okay. Right. Five, six, seven, eight, you said? Four, five, six, seven, 13, and 21. No, eight oh, is still on your side of the table. Yeah. I'll, when we're done, if we have time, I'd like to kind of go over where I think they all are. Because I think once we give you guys these, I think you'll have all of them except for three. So, right. all, like for all of All open articles, I think. Uh, no, just healthcare. Back no, that's what I'm saying. It's not three, the number three, three, oh. like three articles. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. I think that's it's three, ten, and, well, you just gave us ten, so yeah. three, ten, and twelve. And right. I think after today, I think everything else will either be TA'd or right. you guys yeah. will have it. Okay. So the, the yeah, what are that? Oops. All right. I think just um, just because it's nice and quick and easy, I think we'll start with six. Eric. Um, so initially, we had indicated that we were going to be bringing a proposal on six. And that was having to do with 6.4. Oh, you already had the proposal. Actually, right. I might too. Does this track which changes? Yeah. Well, there's no, it, it looks like there's a change in there, but I'm going to explain what that is. Okay. Actually, something else. There you go. So we had initially thought that we were going to be bringing a um, a, a minor change to six based on um, six point four, um, basically wrapped around. We thought initially there may have been some legal implications for arbitration, but um, we now don't think that's the case anymore. We we don't think that that's a problem. the The track changes you see on the left in six point two is for whatever reason the last two sentences were in. 10 point font instead of 12 point font. So that's a track change on fixing a font size. Um, and so for all intents and purposes, that notwithstanding, we're putting six across as basically current contract language. So, and I'm, I'm, we would have brought it sooner. Like I said, we thought we had to make a change, but because we'd indicated we were going to be bringing up the proposal, but it's just literally a CCL. Great. So that one's pretty quick and easy. Yeah. I don't think you guys had, I don't remember if you guys had indicated you thought you needed changes to that one or not. I don't think we. I don't think that would six. Was yeah, I don't think high up there. If we had anything. So. And we will have final word. Sure. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and do four. Now I'm going to let you know that the paper copies, there's two, no, no, no it's all you, that's one, that's oh, just okay. one packet, oh, yeah. a big oh, article. Oh, four. Okay. <laughs> Both start dividing okay. up the pages. Okay. Um, if one, that is one article, I think it's four pages, three pages, it's three pages, the three one, pages front and back. The one that did my color, you can see it here. And, uh, so here's what I try. You guys had asked if what I would do is go ahead and try to like accept the changes and all that. When I started doing that, it made it more confusing to me because then I couldn't remember what was CCL, what did you propose that I was accepting, what was stuff that we had proposed that you were accepting. So instead, what I tried to do is just highlight anything that I changed from your previous version and insert a comment because I think that's going to be the easier way to go through it. Okay. Um, I also want to say before we go through it, there are two areas, one in 4.4 .4 and one in 4.9 on the paper copies where there is lined out language that should be correct on your electronic copies, but that I didn't want to kill 
five more trees. So I just suppress that with them. Okay. So every new change corresponds with the comments. The, that's my intention. Okay. Like I said, what I did was I started accepting changes because that was what we talked about me doing. Mm -hmm. And then I I completely lost my place by the time I got to like 4.2. And I so I just undid it and re-downloaded it and started over. If there's a change that doesn't have a comment, that wasn't my intention. Yeah. So um all right, so the first comment is connected with the purple. It's purple. It should be a purple sentence. Yep. Um, and we believe that was part of your previous proposal that we had initially crossed off. And we're now saying that can be okay. We can leave that. That's good. Okay. Um, we crossed out. Hmm, oh, that comment is an old comment. I don't, I'm not sure from where the C article one comment is. Um, that's part of a previous um, deletion. I did not delete that this yeah. time around. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, PK3, that comment is was re with respect to um, the information being communicated 60 days before about Gator Start, Social Security number, and UF email. Um, we're ready to say yes to that request, that provision. Um, so in in four one three. Four one three. So the blue deleted sentence. Um four one three. If you look at these, these are comments that go together. I didn't put a comment on the blue deleted sentence because that was a suggestion you all had made, but my comment pertains the insertion of the words appointment or. So we're okay with deleting the assignment, the the sentence above where it says university does not make any specific promise of putting an assignment, blah, blah, blah. You guys, we, we keep putting it in, you keep taking it out there. We're okay with taking that out, provided we can insert the phrase appointment or in the ultimate sentence of that paragraph. So the last paragraph would read, the letter of offer shall not be interpreted as guaranteeing specific appointment or assignment details beyond the initial period of appointment. And if and if that's okay, then we're okay with deleting the sentence. The university does not make any specific promise of appointment or assignment details beyond the immediate initial period of appointment detailed below in the article. I'll just keep going through to see how it coheres with itself. Um. All right. Uh, the next one is uh, down at four point four. So this is where we get into the part. We, we probably are still pretty far apart in this next section, to just be honest. Um, we're okay with the sentence about having um, a university initiative to standardize the GA appointment. The standard FTE for a graduate assistant appointment is 0 0.50. We're not okay with a sentence that just universally states that there's no formal limit to the FTD of a graduate assistant um, because there are not we're not seeking to put necessarily a contractual limit on it, but we do believe that there are both practical and academic limits. We don't want to consider those in the contract, but we also don't want to declare explicitly that there aren't that limits don't exist. Because we think that would be confusing to people. Did I did I properly characterize that? Mm -hmm. or no? I don't know. If you want, I mean, feel free to yeah, speak. Yeah, just up. when I looked at it, I from the academic side, in my mind, I'm picturing that table, but recommends the FTE depend on how many courses you're registered for. And I'm just like, no limit scared me. I'm like, somebody could have a 1.5 FTE and register for nine, 12 credits. And in that case, there would be sort of a practical limit, but right. I, don't, I don't, again, I don't, I, I'm thinking catalog, this is contract. I just right. don't want, I would hate for a student to read this and then go talk to their advisor and be like, I, you know, right. Here it is. I'm, I want to work full time and register for 12 credits. And so ignore the grad catalog. Like, no, no, we want you to pay attention to the catalog too. Right. So, just again, our, our effort is we're not, we don't want to create confusion. We don't think we need to put a limit in there, but we also don't want to make just a comprehensive statement that there are no limits because we don't necessarily think that that's, that's true. In a contract sense, it may be, but in a comprehensive sense, it isn't. I can see the logic in what you're saying. Uh, one more time to think through fully, but. I can understand the concept or the logic you want to say. All right. Um, we're then down to. All right. So the um, when it comes to 
The next sentence that we took out, the university recognized that the standard is important for the base compensation rate of graduate assistants, including international students that are barred from employment beyond their assistantship. Again, we're, we're not, we're just not interested in, in codifying that sentence. So you do want to remove it because you said we can accept this sentence. The previous sentence. We can accept the blue sentence. That if you follow the, the dot, oh. it goes all the way to the period yeah. of the previous okay. sentence. Right. Um, but the that one um we're not we're not interested in in putting that sentence in the contract. Um again, contemplating who considers something important and whatnot. We 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 see more trouble with that sentence in the future, especially because it doesn't have any initial explicit binding point. Um, we're we're just not interested in including that. Um, if you go down, um, so you've seen from us before in four point five, um, uh, when appointed employees shall be provided with general criteria concerning appointment. Employees may request clarification of these criteria from their supervisors. We had initially crossed out both of those sentences, that one and the one after. We have left the one after it crossed out, but we have accepted the one before it. Um, going down to on that one. yeah. Okay, that's consistent with our last proposal. We didn't try to reinsert that. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Um, so the next section, um, the the blue section is. This was four point six. We lost the bullet point, but it's four point six. On the oh I'm, I'm on line 94. Yeah. Okay. okay. On our last proposal, that was 4.6. Now, 4.6 doesn't exist. It's a. Yeah, 4.6 is reappointment notice. Or no, 4.6 is just nothing. It's exactly. just down at the end of it. Okay. okay. So but we are line 94. Line 94. Referring so to the, blue, the blue portion of that, at least it's blue on mine, starting with because full time enrollment and ending on line 100 with reinforces this expectation. So we really went back and forth on that for quite a long time. We had a lot of conversation. We're okay with leaving it in, but we're gonna need the addition of the red sentence, which restarts with no appointment, however, shall create any right interest or expectancy of continued employment. And, and I realize that this has been a back and forth throughout this entire process where you know, the university continues to sort of attempt to reinsert or reassert its ability to not being created any forward looking responsibility or employment promise beyond the specific time limited appointment. And we understand and appreciate the fact that GAU continues to try to not necessarily explicitly include it, but seems to continue to push back against that absolutely stark hard line. Mm -hmm. and, and I just want to acknowledge the fact that that is certainly a point of continued disagreement. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't really have anything other to say about it other than you know, for every for every um, statement that attempts doesn't necessarily, but attempts to imply that there may be something beyond, we feel a need to go back and qualify. Just to be clear, that previous sentence doesn't actually say these things. It may say what it says, but it doesn't say this. So that's that's more of a narrative explanation of what we attempted to do in that area. So to summarize. Um, GAU was intentionally attempting to create a very limited right uh, where some form of documentation of performance issues was necessary um, if performance was the reason that reappointment was not occurring. And uh, UF is not interested in establishing that. They want to maintain the absolute right of reappointment or not no qualifications, sole discretion of UF, but you are willing as a concession to kind of accept this description of why a normative expectation lingers for our people and uh, why people have this expectation, but expectation notwithstanding, UFF wants to retain the absolute right. So I think yeah, I would go a little bit farther even than that. And what I would say is I think that it was a very powerful point that we heard and we acknowledge that, and I'm not going to use the exact ways you guys that you described it, but you said, look, how can you have a letter of offer that transcends one appointment period and then also 
act like you didn't just give us an, a letter of offer that had more than one year of appointment. And I think that we acknowledge that that seems to be a bit of a dichotomy. I mean, I think that that is, I think you're going to hear us say, we get that. We, we've heard you. We understand. We do believe that we should acknowledge, I mean, in the article, we're not arguing letter of offer and letter and appointment period. We need to make those clear. We need to clarify those. That's absolutely true. But clarifying them and explaining what they are explicitly is different than conceding that the letter of offer has any binding effect. So clarifying confusion is different than sort of changing the agreement, if that makes sense. Right. The, I'm, just to be clear for everyone, um, GAU's goal, the stated goal, was to change it. We, we changed the language over in the letter of offer section so that 4.6 was the location of where we were trying to make this uh, change. But um, you're you're accepting more clarification, but you are not accepting any change to this absolute right of you. I believe that's that's a fair characterization. So um, I agree then that it is a continued uh, disagreement. Okay. I'd also like to, to add here that I think these, I'm not sure, maybe I'm reading this wrong and maybe you can clarify this, but I, these two sentences don't seem to even work together very well because, um, in the first half, we recognize that there's a normative expectation that reappointment will occur. And yet in your red sentence, it says, shall not create any right interest or expectancy of continued employment. Right. So there is an expectation, but you cannot expect it. So yeah, I, so here's what we're trying to say. It, there's a normative expectation and that was, that was your terminology. And we wanna, on the one hand, understand that in a normal course of business, I'll say this in sort of, look, in, in the normal course of business, when a GA comes to accept an appointment, if everything goes okay, they typically retain the entire period of their term. Some people actually wind up being here a year or two or even three years past when their initial thing was, albeit with oftentimes some modifications. That is much more common and frequent. It's more normative that that happens than out of the blue, someone is just non-renewed. I don't have the statistics on it. I know we could pull those, but I think it's very uncommon because frankly, while the, certainly the GA invests a lot of time, energy, effort, in some cases money in coming to a program, they make decisions on coming here and, and committing to the program, you know, so too do the PI and the department. And you know, it's not normally, it's not in their best interest unless there's a problem to just indiscriminately and arbitrarily say, hey, that was fun for a year or two years while you know, we invested time, energy, and academic effort together, but now we're just gonna part ways for absolutely no reason whatsoever. By the same token, acknowledging that that's the way it typically happens is different than actually creating a legal expectation or a legal right. I understand what you're saying. You don't think they agree. That our intention was what I just tried to describe. Yeah, and perhaps I just don't understand the difference between normative expectation and a legal expectation. What what is a what's a legal expectation? How does that differ from? So, it? if you have a legal expectation, what we're really talking about is the concept of past practice. Like we're trying to avoid a practice argument. To say that, look, this is the past practice, and even though you don't explicitly say it in the contract, because of past practice, we have a right to enforce this expectation. And we're trying to draw a line between however you want to interpret normative expectation and us saying, but there's not a legal expectation, just so that we're clear. This may be the way it typically happens, but that's a different standard than a legal expectation of everybody is entitled to this. And when you say this may be the way it typically happens... That would be the way it typically happens in the past, right? Sure. Or even going forward. I mean, I think our ascension to normative expectation is us saying, again, colloquially and not legally, this is the way it normally happens. That's a normative expectation. This is typically the way it goes. I just am with Austin that it seems very contradictory. I, I think this is a, a section where we're going to have to spend a lot of time mm -hmm. discussing either way. So I don't want to get too caught up in the, the differences here, but I think that's probably one of the many things we'll have to discuss anyways. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, and I'm, I'm acknowledging the fact that this is going to continue to be a place where we just, mm -hmm. frankly, we just have completely different, we have completely, not completely different, but vastly different interests on how we address this particular part of the contract. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, moving on down to four point, I guess it's 4.8. Um, um, yes. Yeah, that should um, that should read the same. That section should read the same. There's a lot of cross outs and underlines and, and different colors, but our intention wasn't to change anything in that section there uh, until you get down to line 
160. And you see my comment is my comment. I, I don't know, what, I, we're not sure what it means. We didn't cross it out, but we also were not exactly sure what you meant by that phrase. So Sorry. we were just looking. So I'm looking at line 160. Yeah, I'm looking at the prior. Um, Was there something else that got changed I didn't add a comment to? I, I might just be lost. Give me a second. Last minute. Uh, yes. So or yeah. underneath reappointment notice, there was the parties recognized the last minute, so on and so forth. But underneath that was, oh, have you inserted the thing changes in appointment? But then the A, B, yes. Okay. Never mind. So that, that new title, changes in appointment, is new, but the A, B are old. Does that make sense? Oh, so did, 4. did 8, I hit a return after like the changes in appointment title, maybe? Yeah. 4.8, okay. uh, the parties recognized the last minute appointments. That used to be 4.8. Right. There was no subtitle called changes in appointment. It went straight into A. Oh, okay. It's oh, wait, wait, wait. I see what happened, actually. Okay. This was, this was mine. Uh, changes in appointment was on the, it was hanging to the prior line. So it said, shall be made in a timely manner as possible as needed. And then it had changes in appointment there. And then when it was where it belongs. Okay. So, like, rate. So, never mind. It was a formatting issue that you fixed, yeah. basically. All right. All right. Go ahead then. All right. We're good. I think we're good. Okay. So, go on to, um, yeah. So, back to 160. Um, we were just hoping you could just, like I said, we didn't cross it out, but we highlighted it. Could you just kind of, Help us understand what you're, what you mean in one sixty, and one sixty one. Like what, help just help us kind of understand what you're trying to accomplish for that one. I'm the one who added it. Um, so. Thank you. Um, well, <laughs> yes. So let's read through the whole thing. Okay. Substantial change to collective bargaining agreement. You will communicate the changes to all affected employees. It will be detailed in a letter on university letterhead. All changes will be incorporated in subsequent letters of appointment. Furthermore, GAU waives the right to grieve such communications, nor file a charge of an unfair labor practice when the university issued such communication. So this whole section is about these communications where you're correcting um, or like updating information, right? Substantive mm -hmm. change. If we are going to waive the ability to grieve or even file a uh, unfair labor practice, which is like we're waiving a legal right at that point when a law itself, if a law itself gets violated, we're saying we don't have the right to like be protected by that law anymore. It seems to me that we wouldn't want to agree to that if like, for example, inaccurate information was pushed to everybody and that that inaccurate information was illegal and we, we would want to like correct the protection of inaccurate, I mean the dissemination of inaccurate information. We wouldn't want to be like, oh, we've waived any rights. Like all these communications could, they don't have to be accurate. They, they could be whatever. It, it doesn't seem like it's a good idea to waive both legal rights and internal rights about these communications without like protecting our ability to make sure that these communications are at least accurate. Okay, now I kind of understand what you're saying. Okay, so here's here's why I was confused. Let me explain why I was confused. So the university is concerned in these cases where we communicate on, on your behalf that we would be accused of either direct dealing or not including the union. Not so much about what the substance of the communication itself is. I remembered you saying something like that, which yeah. is why I didn't just cross right. it. The, I tried to make clear that there is one way in which I don't think it would be wise of us to waive the right. So, so here's the second part of that question, which is, I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't, I'm not aware of the fact 
of where if if we were to send something that was inaccurate, I guess it would depend on whether or not it was like willful and intentional. Like if we like intentionally miscommunicated with, which is again, what I was back to all the way at the very beginning of this whole thing, because this wasn't a provision we were suggesting. This was a provision that you all want. Yeah. yeah. So you want us to do it. And then who is going to sit in judgment about the, like, so here's, here's what I'm, here's what I'm saying. If, if we were to say yes to this, the only thing that we would probably be willing to do is to literally take a PDF of the signed document itself with no letter. I mean, it's literally going to be, gotcha. we're just going to email what we sign. Yeah. Because we don't want there to be even a paper's width of any interpretation yeah. attached to it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I don't think, it sounds like there's no conceivable way in which that could be construed as inaccurate than if it's mm -hmm. the primary document. Correct. Here's, here's, let me give you a practical concern. I'm not sure how useful that communication is going to wind up being. And here's why. Because the impact of any particular contract article, normally, and I'm sure that you all spend a lot of time doing it, just like we spend a lot of time on our end, you spend a lot of time sitting with one of your members or we spend time with one of our administrators saying, okay, look, yeah, in chapter, in, you know, article six, you know, turn to this provision. This is how that is actually applied. This is what it means. This is how we actually deal with it. And while, look, I'm not in any way, shape, or form denigrating the ability of your members to interpret the contract on their own, I am I think that the intention was to clarify and provide clarity to your members very quickly if there was going to be something that changed about their employment relationship with the university. Mm -hmm. I think you guys were pretty, and I appreciated that. I, I, I heard that intent. If we just put a letterhead on the top of a TA and send it out to everybody, I don't know if that's going to accomplish that initial goal. That's, that's all I'm saying. So I, I'm, is there a way that we can maybe rework it so that your goal can be accomplished and we're not worried about some sort of legal exposure? I guess that's, and that's more of a conversation than me proposing a piece of language. Uh, you're taking notes on this. I believe Hannah was spearheading this particular effort. So why don't we talk about it in our committee and get back with you when we repropose. Okay, yeah, because like I said, I think we're we're all for, we, we're in favor of providing clarity. We think that's great. We just don't want to be in a situation where that effort to meet your expectation, which we feel makes sense, you know, we sort of get snake bit for trying to, you know, meet what you want us to do. That's mm -hmm. all. Um, and on some of these issues, which can be confusing and can be contentious, we don't want to be the play. Well, the university told me, and you're like, well, that's not what it means. That's what we're, we don't want to. We don't want to get into a, a second argument about what we told them after we had that disagreement about what it said. So, all right, it's enough on that. Um, all right, I think uh, the next one. Um, there we go. Yeah, the next one. Oh, so this was our attempt. I think we're down all the way at four ten now. Um, no, sorry, four seven in the case of four seven above. Which one's four seven? Four seven is um, reappointment notice. Is that, isn't that what's above there? Four four seven, yeah, reappointment notice, and then it goes to four eight, which is the changes in appointment, which we were just discussing. Yeah. Yeah. You. Changed it to 4.7, but I think you still want it to be 4.8. It yeah, could cool. be that um, you initially plan to strike uh, reappointment eligibility entirely, and you changed it thinking that one of the articles would be gone, so the numbering would go minus one, but then you left that portion of reappointment. Oh, okay. Got it. That may be what happened. Oh. Where are we on? They're on four point nine, and they. Oh, okay. I got it. But wait, you left it as four point eight. Is that no, it goes all the way to four point nine. What change are you discussing? I want to make sure that there isn't a change. I'm reading through right. that section. I'm looking through lines. So you're looking at four point seven reappointment notice. I just want to make sure that there weren't any. I'm looking back at. I just want to make sure there weren't any changes. There weren't any intended changes. You guys should have already seen one seventy nine through two seventeen. You shouldn't see. You shouldn't see any changes in there. And if you do, let's talk about what you see. I don't have any noted. One seventy. Yeah. I don't. I do see that you, just, you manually. 
uh, struck through as teaching assistance online. To that's all the way down at 410. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's what I want to talk about. I just want to make sure I don't skip over anything that. Okay. All right. So for that, so before then, all that's just crossed out. Yeah. That was how it was before. Okay. I don't. So that's what you crossed out from what we proposed last time. Yes. So in the case of 4.7 BA4, the university shall, like all that's stricken. I just can't remember if we struck it last time or if we struck it the time before. Do you have, I don't have your last version. Do you have your last pair? I'll put up on here. I'll just put it up on the computer. For some reason, I'll put that. Are you sharing the? Yeah, I'm sharing the article. So it didn't show up because the article's on the screen, so it matches to the monitor. So when I'm sharing it, it doesn't share to both, so I can look at it. Let me pull up your last one that I have. Sorry. The one from 2-22-24 that you guys sent me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah, so 177. Starting in line 179. Yes. That's all crossed out. That's consistent. That's consistent. So this was crossed out from last. Yeah, from at least the one that I'm that I have marked GAU counter proposal two twenty two dot twenty four. It shows everything crossed out all the way through line two o two, which starts with C when the university has reason to believe, which is and it matches what we have here. So you guys are free to check, but that looks consistent. All right, so down at um, we tried to in four ten which it actually is under the line number. Like it's all the way under line 222. That's where it says the 410. I don't know how it got moved over that far. We tried to rework it based, Jacob, on what you had said last time, which we understood about sort of creating a backdoor by which we could over time get rid of all 12 month appointments for the purposes of basically doing away, doing away with the tuition waiver over the summer. So what we tried to do is go back and this is what we came up with. Um, so, and as teaching assistance was supposed to have been crossed out, um, and it was not, I, I said that earlier. So continuing nine month employees with assistant with assignments during successive assignment years, meaning it can't be for like the summer you graduate, um, may also be appointed for the duration of in the intervening summer term, provided that the employee continues to maintain satisfactory student status. You've seen that before from us. This is the change for nine month employees receiving summer term appointments that are, here's the key phrase, either substantively different from their nine-month appointment and assignment or who are appointed in a different unit. So this is what I think, Jacob, would address your concern because a lot of the people that we are trying to address with our interest was when there are other units or other departments or other programs or other PIs that may have an opportunity just for the summer. But it can't be like, you work with Dr. Smith from August through May, and now Dr. Smith is going to offer you a summer doing exactly the same thing, but he does just want to give you tuition. Yeah. This would be, for example, like you're going to go work in the Whitney lab, which happens a lot. Okay. That's a totally different thing. You're, you normally work in Gainesville. Right. You're going to go work in the Whitney lab for the summer or, you know, so course. exactly. Yeah. We're trying to create, there has to be a clear identifiable distinction between the work you're doing during your nine month appointment. And then whatever you were being offered to do in this summer, otherwise you would, they couldn't do it. They couldn't deny you the tuition. So waiver. they can only deny you the tuition waiver if the summer appointment is substantially different. Or in a different location. Like you normally work in one department and they're like, oh, this professor has an opportunity. I'm not on a 12 month, but I can go right. do that and I can make some money and they need some help. Um, I Just a clarifying yeah. question. I guess in this, with this exact language, would a situation if a professor moved departments or something, then in that case could... Mm -hmm. no, I didn't think about that. that. Yeah, I didn't think about that. I don't. I think that situation would be extremely rare for that. But it, I guess that could be like a loophole saying like if they move departments or locations, yeah. they can just do that. But I think it's that's some, uh, yeah, I get a lot of hassle. So, to, so here's, here's the thing. Yeah. But but to that point, it wouldn't change your appointment. Just because your professor moves, your appointment is still coming from the previous department because it says you're appointed in a different unit. Okay. So your appointment would still be. Right, mm -hmm. your appointment because it says appointment and assignment because or, it doesn't really or. talk about location directly in there. You just mentioned that, so okay, I think that. Well, and don't we also? What did we do up above about the substantive change regarding your appointment assignment department? 
But don't we have to notify you in writing? Wasn't you have to that... receive a notification of Lady J's appointment if it uh, substantively changed. Where's the language above? Um, it goes in the communication part. It's where we were before. Uh, if the change impacts one of the required elements listed in 4.2, 4.2 includes. It includes employment unit, yeah. appointment, and name of supervisor. Name of supervisor. Yeah. So, I mean, if you want to massage it a little bit, but I think you kind of understand what we we're yeah, trying no, that, to do. Yeah, I mean, that, that seems pretty clear. Um, I was just, that's just kind of first yeah. thought that and, the professor changes. No, you're right. I think it's, po it's, it's possible to read it that yeah. way. So, if we need to shore it up a little bit, but I think what it really does is it addresses your major concern, which right. is you're just going to have us do the same thing all year, but you're right. just not going to give us the tuition waiver in the summer. Uh, we had also considered that. Um, like the you had mentioned that one of the main reasons in making it so that people don't have to have tuition waivers is maybe they're not even needed to take summer classes. Right. Um, and we talked about one way to close the back door would be um, tuition waivers are only if, if someone is not required to take summer classes then a tuition waiver need not be awarded. Um, do you have like a reasoning behind going about it this way rather than that way? Sure. Um, so I, I think kind of what we had said before, in the example where you're going to a different department, that department is going to be less likely to be able to hire you and afford you to pay the tuition waiver in a department that's a program you're not even part of. So in other words, so in the, in the instance, again, in, and it's not the only example, but an example I'm contemplating now, you normally work in chemistry, you're going to go work in physics over the summer. In order for the physics to hire you, they've got the money they want to bring you and you're going to get some experience and you're going to have an opportunity to work. But now in order for them to hire you, they have to pay for your chemistry tuition, even though you're working in the physics department. And they're going to say, well, I can't, you know, we can't afford it. I mean, I think kind of the main thing with that is, is that it is tuition you have to pay, but the actuality is that you're not taking any classes, you're just getting credit for your research. So, but you still paying tuition on those research credits, if that makes sense. So, yeah. so, so in, in that case, you're saying, well, the, they, you don't want another department paying your chemistry tuition, right? But if, if I'm working at the physics, so using that same example, right. if I'm working at the physics department over the summer, I still need to be registered as a student. So I would register for like some type of research credit. So there's no class or anything associated with that. I'm just getting credit for the research I'm doing over the summer. But I still have to pay tuition, fees, and everything else on those credits. So I'm going to take that to Tom because I'm not sure that's the way we, I'm not sure yeah, that's the way I, we talked about it. I, and I want to be careful I get this right. So that's a good question. That's why I thought one of the reasons for this, because you'd just be a nine-month employee, you'd have right. that summer assignment, so you wouldn't need to be registered for credits in order to... But I thought system. other places in the CBA say you had to be graduates, registered as a graduate student. That's the, I think that's the exception here. This allows a nine-month employee who's got a nine-month one year and a nine-month the next year to have an assistantship okay. appointment without being an without, active student okay. in the summer. And that, that gets rid of that concern. Why don't right. we go ahead? Well, that right? yeah. yeah. Well, that's what, what you and Judy and I spent that's like an hour and a half having this conversation okay. in the office. Yeah. Let us, we'll, we'll talk about it again. I think okay. our, if, if it's possible, I think our intention is if you're not required right. to be taking courses, or even if you are. So let me go. To, I'll go to the other example. I gave you the example that we think is more positive. The example that's negative is, look, no, we, we, we don't, we understand that you have to take courses. We just don't have the money to pay the tuition waiver, but we still want to be able to offer you an opportunity to work, but we can't, we can't afford to offer you the opportunity to work if we also have to pay the tuition waiver. Okay. So I guess the question would be understanding what you had said about using it as a way to, you know, distance how many of the GAs we pay for in the summer, even with the separation in the work itself. Do you believe there's interest and value in us having those opportunities, even if they don't come with a tuition waiver? Or do you believe that's a bridge too far and you don't have interest in doing it? Because I can understand I can understand if that's the position. We're trying to provide that as a as an opportunity and a choice. As long as we tell them in advance, we can't like butt hook people down and be like, just kidding, you're not getting a tuition waiver. Like we have to say, hey, look, I want you to come over to physics just so that you know we can hire you, we can pay you, but we can't cover your tuition waiver. We're telling you up front, do you have interest or not? I think we kind of view that as a everybody can win, 
but I understand your point about you viewing that possibly as an erosion of your rights. So I, I, guess I see it as like there's a possible middle ground where you're saying there's some nine months who are not expected to take summer classes. Yeah. Right. If you're so, yeah. So if we put in like the language I said a few minutes ago of like if a GA is not required to take summer classes, no tuition waiver is necessary. You are creating like this new workforce to fill those types of positions, but no one's like rights. Uh, no one who like has to take summer classes is like being put in a position of like, damn, I wish I had my tuition waiver, but I guess I need the money too. So I guess this is better than nothing. And, you know, putting them in this, more desperate, like I got to compromise, I guess, that is kind of like a, that's a ambivalent type of feeling for that type of GA. But for a GA who doesn't have to take classes in the summer anyway, and they're, they would like to make money, it seems like that would create some labor force for you to fill some of these yeah. jobs and no one would be harmed in that like middle ground. Yeah, so you're back to Brandon's question about would the person be required right. to actually register for the Yeah, research? so if, if they're, if, if we, if the ideal situation, they wouldn't have to register. So if they didn't need right. to take the classes or they could skip the summer, that's fine. I just don't want the situation. Cause like in my case, for example, my, my, my department doesn't offer classes over the summer. Right. So usually every summer I just apply for the research credit and I'm just doing research over the summer, but I'm still paying the tuition and, paying and everything else. On it. Yeah. yeah. So, so I that, still yeah. paying the tuition, the fees, everything else. Yeah. The summer. Let's, let's, so the old, yeah. The old, I can chat okay. about that. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Because the old one, the old 4.9 had this weird carve out. And I think it was a Whitney lab was one of the user. It basically said, if you had a nine month teaching assistant, one year mm -hmm. assistantship, and then you knew you're going to have a nine month teaching assistantship the next year, yeah. But your department has no courses for you to teach in the summer. You could get, you can't, so you're not going to get a teaching assistantship. You, you might be able to get appointed as a research mm -hmm. employee, get paid for the research assistantship, and not have to take classes. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, that's the idea. If you don't need the credits, you don't have to pay for them. The department doesn't have to pay for them. You can still get hired as a research assistant. But that is an interesting category. Yeah. Of, well, what if you do need to take the courses and then you're having to take courses and pay for them out of pocket while being an assistant? Mm -hmm. I don't think that's our intent. Our maybe, intent is, yeah. Maybe we could be about. more explicit in, like, if if we were using the other language that I've been referencing throughout this, um, we could be more explicit in that we are making an exception for these yeah. people who are not required to take courses over the summer, yeah. who are willing to fill these roles. Those specific people could be working as GAs without yeah. taking courses. In that oh. one case, if maybe if we were more explicit about making that exception, right. and we stuck, if we limited the people who fell into that exception as the people who are not required to take summer courses right. to begin with. Mm -hmm. I don't see currently a downside on GAUs and to that, and I right. do think it gives you a the extra labor pool that you're after it does it does disadvantage it would disadvantage one group and that would be the group that is required to take courses but doesn't have a 12-month appointment and they just giving them the option to choose if they to continue their employment they but up with the understanding that they would have to pay tuition on right that or something. well they're gonna have to pay tuition in that right. case they're paying tuition anyway right because but, if they're on a nine-month appointment and they have to take courses over right, the summer exactly. They're not getting a tuition waiver for the summer. Mm -hmm. So if they're if they have to be registered, I know I don't know program by program how frequent that is. Yeah. But yeah. well, I mean, I mean, if you're if you only have a nine month, yeah, I'm not I'm not too but, familiar with a nine month the assistant, like if you're required to take courses. Yeah, like, I'm reach not, out to our people. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to ask them. I, but I think yeah. in, because in, if in that a, is a situation which people find themselves in where they're already paying out of pocket for summer tuition and being required to do so. Yeah. Then right. maybe there is no harm in letting them be part of this. So That's, we need to reach out to yeah, yeah, to, check out. to, the, to, to yeah. the workforce thing. At least for teaching assistantships, the whole problem is they're it's not that they need workforce; it's that they don't have good classes for them to teach. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think I think we would just need to figure out if that's the case. But I mean, I 
because I will, like I said, I don't think we're one hundred percent sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah. But I don't think, uh, I don't think it does. Yeah, like my experience is yeah. limited to one yeah. college. Is yeah. Normally, if you're requiring a student to take courses in the summer, it's because you're trying to meet the criteria. So you have to hold right. the system. Right. Yeah, I don't know about any that. program yeah, that yeah, even that requires summer classes. You, mostly, it's requiring this the classes themselves and you just take it whenever they're offered. Right. Right. You know, like yeah. not a certain summer. Yeah. So some, some of the more specific stuff, notwithstanding, give us a sense of the overall general concepts. I mean, is it, are we, are we closer? Is there still zero interest? Do you think we have something workable here? I it mean, it seems like there is possibility to do something that would benefit both of us, but since it's kind of uncharted territory, we're trying to be careful about no, it. No, I get that. Through it. So I, get that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to commit to anything, but like it does seem like there's potential for okay. something that could be mutually beneficial. I don't think it's the thing that's going to hold us back. There's many other parts. Yeah, I think, uh, there's, 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 yeah, other parts I think another thing to consider too is that I'm not sure maybe if, a, I guess the only situation where I could see that right now is if the class is only offered in the summer, you're a nine month employee and you have to take the class to complete your degree. That would be the only kind of, oh, point, yeah. I don't know if that exists. I don't know possible, if that, but it's possible. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how many programs are like, yeah, you're a nine month employee, but we're only going to offer this class, class over the summer. summer. It doesn't make sense, but it could it happen. Could happen. Right. Yeah. Or like undergrads, I think, have to take a certain amount of summer credits. Yeah. But that doesn't know. Well, yeah. Yeah. That's your requirement. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. You guys yeah. have more questions on that one, or do you want to go ahead and move on? I think we'll just have to discuss a lot more on yeah. that. I know there's a lot there. Okay. okay. All right, so that's four. You've seen six, you've seen four. Let's move on to, let's move on to five. Okay, thank you, Robert. All right, let's take a look here. This this did different colors. I don't know why. It's on the same thing. This there's a lot of peach on this one. I don't know why. Okay. Um. So uh, I did not do what I did in Article Four on this in terms of um, like highlighting and commenting on every um, every change. So if you want to, you might want to pull up your previous. I'm actually going to do that too. As we've gone back and forth on some of these, um, you know, we've had enough iterations where it's tough to remember who said what. Wow. So this was, you would propose this on the 22nd. So uh, I've got yours up. I'm looking at, it looks like uh, by the employee supervisor for that employment term was something you guys proposed last time. We're good with it. The orange there um, is something we proposed, but it looks like you accepted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, down to five two. Written about the add additional text. Where? Right. This does not wait. For some reason, that was only in the comment instead of. Yeah, that's. I have it listed as a comment by Hannah, but it wasn't in your proposal. It was just a comment off to the side, so I didn't take it as part of the article proposal. Yeah, it's probably was, I know we a, have. We were so I, yeah, part. I think I would do it. I meant to bring it over, but that's that's all right. We can just talk about it next time. Mm -hmm. it's made. Sorry, yeah. So continuing um, on, then. it would just for for what it's worth. There's nothing in that. There's nothing in there that is a waiver. So I mean it. it I'm not saying you shouldn't propose the Senate. I'm just saying I don't I don't think there's anything in there that would preclude you from grieving that. But oh. um five two, uh the written evaluation. This is all this uh, uh okay, so the first sentence you had suggested the written evaluation should include an explicit statement as to whether the employee successfully met employment expectations or demonstrated efficiencies in their performance. We think it should be clearer than that and just say the written evaluation should include an explicit statement as to whether or not the employee's performance was satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Because we kind of went back and forth about whether or not it's possible for someone to have a satisfactory evaluation 
but also demonstrate areas for improvement. And we think that employees and supervisors, employees should be aware and supervisors should commit to a binary state of this person had satisfactory performance or they did not. They can't meander between, well, you did a lot of good things that were good and a lot of things that weren't so good. And then the employee is left wondering, wait a second, is this an acceptable evaluation or is it not? Because sometimes people will give a satisfactory evaluation, but get very specific and detailed feedback about an area they want somebody to improve in. And sometimes the employee can be left thinking they didn't necessarily get a good evaluation. And the employer is left saying, no, no, no. We think you did an okay job, but we just want to give you feedback on this area. Yeah. Similarly, similarly, sometimes there can be a single area of deficiency, and that's enough to turn an otherwise positive evaluation into an unsatisfactory evaluation if it's one big really thing yeah. or they've been coached on it or whatever. So anyway. We're not attached to any particular language. Uh, I was yeah. carrying the language of that sentence you all added, should know such evaluation. You can see they successfully met employment expectations. Right. And then elsewhere, you had used the word about deficiencies. Right. Yeah. So, what was most important to us is linking all these with the same word, right. which it seems like you have done. We're trying. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, so, we sort of yeah. did. Go ahead. I, I mean, I would think that in that case, like the sentence in 5.1 would be empo- met employment expectations should be changed to that satisfactory yeah. language yeah. as I well, it. I would think. Just and, to keep it consistent. But I, I, I do agree with you. A, which is that. good. Yeah. yeah. You, we just want consistency across this. Right. And yeah, that there sense. was um, corresponding parts in Article 4, too, but those were strapped, of course. Mm-hmm. But we were trying to keep consistent language throughout. I got so it. All, really all right. I'll make a note up in 5.1. I mean, changing met employment expectations was satisfactory. I don't yeah, satisfactory I don't, evaluation. I don't, or I don't see that being a problem. Yeah. Robert, are you good with that? Yeah. All right, so down in, uh, so then we, I believe this sentence is added from us, which is to try to really expand on the first sentence. Supervisors are encouraged to provide specific feedback regarding areas of improvement. If a supervisor provides an employee with an unsatisfactory evaluation, specific deficiencies in performance must be provided to the employee. In other words, you can't just say you didn't do any good. Like you have to be like, why? (laughs) Not just, no, you have to be able to, that's a re- we think that's a very reasonable standard and expectation. All right. Um, then I think it picks back up with with the E and evaluations through the rest of that paragraph should be exactly the same as your previous yeah. proposal. Yeah, that's good. Then down to uh, A. Um, the colors are different. So we struck uh, employees who were evaluated as demonstrating deficiencies and replaced it with employees who received an unsatisfactory rating. Again, for the purposes of trying to be consistent. And here is the key word out of the entire article, may. And I know that you guys really want it to be must, and we're gonna pretty much insist that it be may. Um, Maybe offer a corresponding. I don't think, frankly, after that word, there's much else that's different. Uh, the whole back page has no changes whatsoever. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really, gonna, it's, and just like I said in the previous one, it's whether or not the an improvement plan is compulsory or is it a um, is it an option? And I think uh, and, and I think Jacob, I think you did a good job pointing this out last time, where you said, look, the the component of the renewal provision is pretty inextricably linked to the PIP provision the minute you you link them. Like they become very much they become very much connected. Current contract language, like clearly I crossed it out and said address below. But current contract language on 5.2 is the evaluation should be discussed with the employee, at which time any deficiencies shall be specifically noted and suggestions for improvements made. So we move that sentiment to A to elaborate on it. But if you strike it out of A, and we struck it out of 5.2 because we moved it to A, we are actually, there is already the expectation for specifically noted and suggestions for improvements made. Yeah. That's so, different than putting somebody on a formal PIP. Those aren't the same thing. Can you clarify how they would be different than? 
deficiencies being specifically noted and suggestions for improvements made? Yeah, well, I think the term, at least in the terms that we've seen from your proposals, is that a PIP is a compulsory plan that has to be monitored and executed that the employee in your proposal, the employee doesn't have to participate in if they don't want, but we have to offer it. If we don't procedurally offer it, then we can't not renew them. So being being forced to make suggestions and demonstrating and explaining what the provisions are, which is what we try to capture in if a supervisor provides an employee with an unsatisfactory evaluation, specific deficiencies in performance must be provided to the employee. That's what that's where we try to capture that. So basically on B, a PIP must contain uh, one is definitely part of CTL. Two is definitely part of CTL, but you're saying that maybe three and four are kind of new things that you're not currently mandated to do. We we didn't cross any of that out. No, I know, but you changed it to May, and we removed the current contract language for five point two because we were addressing it in A instead. So. In a roundabout way, the obligation has disappeared for at which time any deficiency shall be specifically noted and suggestions for improvements made. So the, the phrase deficiencies shall be specifically noted seems to be pretty redundant with B1, a description of the performance deficiencies. And then the phrase and suggestions for improvement made seems pretty synonymous with two steps the employee should take to remedy the deficiency. So if you're saying that a PIP is different than current contract language, then another way to say that is that point three and four, maybe. Five is just kind of a clarification of what a PIP is, but three and four are the parts that are not current a current obligation. Well, like I said, if you look at the third sentence that we put in up in 5.2, we, we, we have no intention of withholding that information from the employee when we give them an unsatisfactory rating. I mean, that's what we put there. Okay. I mean, we said if supervisor provides an employee with an unsatisfactory evaluation, specific deficiencies in performance must be provided to the employee. I mean, that's, we, we and I just said that. I, we acknowledge that if someone gets an unsatisfactory evaluation, we should tell them, we should communicate it to them. We need to tell them what they didn't do well. It doesn't say to your point and also suggest how they can improve. I guess maybe it we does? no 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 in our in our new sentence. And, okay, but this current contract language says and suggestions for improvement. Yeah, yeah. That, what I was what I was gonna finish saying is if you well, want and suggestions to be included in that sentence, I don't think we have a problem with that. We we felt like that sentence up there took, I mean, met what that had previously said. Okay, so so you're saying that like that language applies because it's talking about evaluations that's referencing the discussing the evaluation and stuff, not the PIF, which is right. the next few sentences talking about the PIF. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Can we take a step back? I think I've like maybe uh, muddied the water a bit. Okay. But we keep saying must yes. instead of may. Correct. Right. And you keep wanting may. Yes. So that's like saying there isn't an obligation to do the PIF. Right. right, right. And so with 5.2, what I'm saying is what the current obligation is, as far as any deficiency shall be specifically noted mm -hmm. and suggestions for improvements made and the sent to added, which correspond well with that. Right. All of that coalesces really well with B, a PIP must contain a description of performance deficiencies and B2, steps the employees should take to remedy the deficiencies. So what I'm saying is, if three and four weren't there, then I don't imagine why you would have an issue with the word must, because it seems like okay. it's already an obligation. So you're saying. when you're trying to make it may, does that mean that specifically there's some issue with like three and four, that there's an extra obligation that three and four bring to the table that you're not comfortable in saying must no, anymore? No, it's, it's, it's the concept of a PIP itself. So a PIP or a performance improvement plan comes with it all types of expectations of continuous monitoring, steps of improvement, you know, continuously revisiting the person saying you're getting better, you're not getting better. If and when there's an implication that if you successfully complete a PIP that you would get back on the right track. Robert, is there anything else about, I mean, just very detailed. It's a very like, uh, specific, it's different than. Good. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. But what feedback do you give 5.2? <laughs> 
varies in terms of what a fit would actually look like in, 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 in the form of a, it sounds like a contract line, you know, it's like multiple pages. There's a lot of, so, you know, um, metrics and, and deliverables. And so I think there's just, there is a difference. I don't know how else to describe it, just with the extended detail of providing a fit. Yeah. All right. So that clarification helps. Um, just we'll talk amongst the committee. Uh, me striking stuff and saying a draft below seems like probably shouldn't do that because you're saying these two things are different. So uh, right. we'll talk about this more amongst ourselves, mm -hmm. and we will most likely yeah. unstrike what I struck above and said address below because it seems like you're saying what's up there with 5.2 and not about a pit is separate. Yeah, I think the intention, the intention we are agreeing upon, but it's just the language mix that was a little confusing. Well, like, I, I got, I was confused what you're saying, but yeah. I got it. And if, and if you, yeah. I think we would probably be open to up in 5.2 to include the phrase and suggestions for improvements. Like if you want to make sure that we recapture that sentiment in a non-PIF situation, like in every time you get feedback, if you get negative feedback, it's not just the deficiency itself. I don't think we would necessarily have a problem with having to say you didn't do this well and in the future this would be a way to do it better like i don't think we would necessarily be opposed to that probably okay depending well, on how we worded it i have to talk more through pips and okay, yeah. with everything else, but it's helpful to have the clarification sure and there, and we didn't have any changes in five three or five four so all right let's move on to number That one, not that one. What do we got next? Seven. Let's do seven. Oh, okay, so that was it. Yeah. I tried to open it and share my screen and it just crashed my browser. So it's like, okay. It doesn't show up there because of how I have the gotcha. screen set up, but we all have physical copies here. All right. So number seven, um, the seven one. Oh, you don't have to. Sorry. All right. All right. Um, 7.1. Uh, we're suggesting to add the actual mathematical representation just purely for clarity. Um, I don't really think that necessarily have any substantive effect. It does provide some clarification. Um, that comment, I think, is actually Sikander's comment there. That's not my comment. Um, yeah. You know, this the average that's current contract language does not include that sentence, so we're fine. Basically, our our proposal at this point is to say, you know what? Forget it. That there's we are on such different planets in terms of how to deal with this problem. We basically want to just return to a current contract language proposal, with the exception being um, the things that we can deal that we can accept are your language suggested down to seven point two, which is by the way set the initial seven point two was the first part of seven point two was ours. The second part of seven point two was yours. We've struck we've even struck in the language that you guys had initially agreed to. 7.2 is a new thing you all had suggested that says clarification of FT upon request by UFFGAU or an employee, our department shall provide a description of its expectation for FTE and ensure the FTE calculation complies with Article 7.1. And the process does not prohibit the employee from accessing the grievance process pursuant to Article 22 if the employee believes such action is reasonable. So at this point, we are so far apart in terms of how to address this article. I don't see us being able to land the plane reasonably. Um, and so we're we're at this point we're prepared to say you know what we may have made some progress let's just go back to current contract language and here's one of the here's one of the things that really drove the point home for me in the last since I've been here in 14 months and I know Robert had a case before that the university has denied to my understanding and I checked we have denied exactly zero workload grievances that have been brought by GAU we have denied zero none. So I just think that that's not 
certainly not an indication that everything's perfectly fine, but it's certainly an indication that we're not spending a lot of time arguing about individual cases of this. So I think that we both have some pretty strong perceptions about how this is going. And I, I just don't think that our conversation was terribly productive to make big changes to this article. Can so you, can you repeat that? There are zero cases of what? I, I, I was not able to find any grievances that were denied brought by GAU based on workload. Like a GA had said, hey, I'm I'm filing a grievance under seven because I've been overworked. Yeah. I could not find any that were denied. I actually, I couldn't even find any that were brought, really, but I know that you had the one case, but it was from like two years before I started. So, and I'm, I'm not saying that you didn't anecdotally provide compelling information and compelling evidence. I'm not saying that. All I'm yeah. saying is we're on, we just seem to be on very, very different, very different perspectives on how to address this article if we're going to make changes to it. So, could you comment on, uh, because on the last proposal, we were changing to try to leave the distinction of the academic versus the uh, like employment work, right? They like on a like a apartment level. Sure. Like what is that? Like what's your reasoning of this? Not thinking that's a good avenue to try to work. Well, with? we felt we felt because it was our language that that was actually a concession that you were over making to us for that language, right? And we felt it was unfair. I'll just be honest. We felt it was unfair to ask you to continue to accept our new language if we weren't willing to accept your new language. So we're like, well, if you're not, we're not gonna tell you, we're not gonna continue to ask you to take something new on a provision that you initially were against if we're not willing to reasonably consider the ones that you wanna qualify it with, but that's you, why. But you, but you still acknowledge that the distinction between academic and employment, employment work is still like a problem, right? Or like, you just, because there's, there's not really any cases of, Grievance is being denied on workload that it's not really a problem we should just keep. No, I what I'm saying is is that I think that our our methods for approaching how to address it are fundamentally different. Okay. They're fundamentally different. Um, you know, when once we crossed into once we got a proposal that started predetermining grievance outcomes and contractually obligated the university to pay money for before the grievance was even heard. Like that's just a bridge that's so far beyond what we would be willing to agree to. I just don't know if we're going to be able to have any productive negotiations on that type of a topic. I mean, I feel like I understand about your idea of it yeah. being like for us proceeding, but I felt like we were at least working towards something that was at least better than what we had in current contract level. So that's why I was just asking. I'm just yeah. I just think that, you know, I just wanted like a little bit more in your reasoning, like why you think that we just can't. Yeah, I, at all. I think we would we, we would be interested in sort of an incremental. I mean, over time, you sort of incrementally change the contract. We just think that, frankly, th okay. this this isn't an incremental change. I mean, this is a complete right. deviation from what we're doing, okay. and we just not we're just not we're just not interested. I think I heard so, that specifically about the department. So that would be seven point four. Okay. Yeah, because I I was just asking like because I felt, felt like we were working towards like leaving it up to the discretion of departments versus just having like a hard like uh, explanation that applies to everyone here. And I was just saying like what's the re like yeah. like why they didn't so like, feel like that was like a step towards the right direction. Right. So I heard you, uh, Patrick. I heard you mention like some of the stuff in seven point two C, et cetera. But what? Why are you striking 7.4, I think, Brandon? And uh, we're, we're not interested right. in creating new reporting requirements on departments so that their their departments, for all departments to have to report to, basically, it doesn't say it, but it's pretty much so that we can be reporting this information to you guys. I mean, that's basically what it's talking about. You you want every department to create a workforce report and give it to you guys. That's really what's intended. <laughs> At least the way I read it, for, the, for the GAs the GAs are not going to be individual employees are not going to be pouring over these reports. These are going to be collected by GAU and then analyzed, which is what it would intend to do. And what I would say is, based on the fact that there have been again zero denied grievances, why do we need to go through all of this reporting requirement and make everybody do it if, based on the grievances we're experiencing, we're not getting any? Um, you saw our presentation about the average amount of hours that people are working, though. So you could argue that the lack of grievances is reflective of people feeling unable to grieve this, which is what we were saying when we were trying to distinguish it. 
So part and of this could help distinguish it, and it would do it in less of a blanket way than you you had trouble with the, the like more blanket way we defined it in seven point two. And you said there's like a lot of variation and nuance and stuff. So 7.4, where you're getting down to the departmental level and then explaining rather than after the fact, people are like, feels like I'm being overworked. I don't know where this line is. Having departments actually explain that to their students seems like very much in line with what you wanted. When you were having, when you're saying there should be a distinction in 7.2, and you didn't like the proposed definition because it was too blanket, it seems like that 7.4 in particular strikes me as very mutually. Uh, you said gradual change, right? That yeah. seems like the most gradual change. So. So I, I Every think aspect. the other the other component to your to your point about the presentation that we saw last last time we were here, you know, I asked a pretty pointed question about distinguishing between one of the testimonials that you all provided, and I felt like I got kind of a a non straightforward answer because I felt at least in that testimonial and one other one that you all showed that it appeared that there was at least a significant chance that people had added up all time they spent at the university and that was the number that they were reporting. Because one person even referred to their work spent as on the job training when they were doing academically. It was, again, I don't even think that we had a clear presentation from you all about what was and what was not reported as employment time versus academic time. The requirements that we set out when we got this information from graduate students was separating employment time versus academic time. They were specifically separate questions. Okay. And we encouraged that. And we asked them specifically how much time they were working over their FTE on specifically employment work. Okay. And those are the results we gave you. I don't know why I pointed to the screen, but that's the results <laughs> that's we gave you. Um, I do have some other comments, but we do have a question in the chat sure. real quick. Uh, so Bryn, if you wanna ask your clarifying question. Yeah, um, so for, um, you're saying that the, U, the university hasn't denied any workload grievances, but um, I would like more information on what that means like you mean you haven't denied them at the step one level or you haven't denied them when they've gone past that what do you mean by that because grievances are oftentimes worked out before they even get to the formal stages so are you which stage are you saying that uf has never denied a grievance at? i didn't say never i said since i've been here i'm not aware of any workload grievances being denied oh so since you've been here Oh, okay. You said ever. <laughs> I absolutely did not say ever. 14 months. So Austin, I have a question for you about the survey. How yeah. many people responded? But like, well, I don't think that was on the... Um, for some of them we had notes for, but I, we might not put it in some of the surveys. So we had around 600 respondents and not all of those answered every question. Some people didn't give correct answers and things like that. So we manually went through each one and checked to make sure that they had valid answers. So for... Uh, some of those questions regarding how much they overworked and stuff, we probably had around 300 responses, less when it was specifically at international students, but I don't have the exact number for you there. Um, but it was a sizable portion of our, our graduate base. Um, and the, the results were very clear. It wasn't, you know, about 50-50 on what was going on. And I think that directs me back to what I wanted to talk about, which I think, I mean, I think I disagree a lot, um, which is a very broad statement. But I think, first off, um, I mean, we, we identify that there's a significant problem with overwork. Um, and I think our presentations to Canada made that very clear that we've collected data and it shows there is a significant overworking issue. And Sikandra also said during our Article 10 presentation that we have connected those two issues. In our, in our mindset here, we are focused on either solving overwork and solving how much people get paid when they're working 40 hours a week and only getting paid for 13. So to step back from this issue and say we're not interested in solving the issue and leaving it, that is not, I mean, that takes away 50% of what we're, we're going for, of course, but it also makes it so we don't have any other thing but to push harder on Article 10. And I hope you understand that, that that is the counterpart to solving this workload issue is being very much, you know, not backing down on Article 10 and discussing that a lot harder because we need to be able to solve this workload issue one way or another. People are being overworked and not being paid enough. 
and we made that very clear in our presentation. I, I would I would disagree with your description that those are your only two options. My question would be, if it were true, and, I, and I'm, I'm rejecting the, the, the premise, mm -hmm. that the average out of 4,050 GAs, if all 4,050 GAs, and I'm, I don't have it open in front of me, I believe the assertion was made that every single one of them works 12 and a half hours a week extra. Yes. I believe that was the assertion. Well, that's the what average, the data showed. Right? The average okay. Showed, yeah. So, I mean, that's the average. So we'll do the multiplication. Yeah. How is it possible? How is it possible that if that it's so, it's so comprehensive that every single GA is working an extra 12 and a half hours a week, why is GAU not bringing any grievances about it? Because there we are not. bringing grievances about it. First of all, you're yes. only looking at the grievances in your past year. In the past year, less than a year that you've been here, first of all, you need to look at every single grievance that we've brought if you're going to make a claim like that. Okay. Also, people, this is how the people feel like they need to do to for things to get done. And we're saying that that's not fair. And we're saying that if we are, if people are being, if this is such a profoundly um, prominent issue in amongst our workforce, then they need to be able to um, be paid more and be compensated for all of that extra time that they're doing because it is a beyond their contract. And I guess my, my question remains: if it was this, if it was, if this was the problem. And you all are saying, we know this is a problem. We recognize this problem. And there are every week 4,200 contract violations going on, but we don't have any interest in bringing grievances. We just want to ask you to increase our salary. Our discussion here is, you know, when you specifically talk about workload is, um, I lost my train of thought here. Um, we don't, I mean, we don't have the manpower to bring 4,200 grievances uh, every day. Um, I lost my train of thought. I, it might come back to me, but I without a clear distinction. We can start. We can start bringing forty-two hundred grievances if that's what you want. I, I, yeah, sorry. I was going to say under the clear distinction. That's what we're trying to solve here is to find a clear distinction. So if we start bringing forty-two hundred overwork cases to you guys every week, we have very clear-cut language of what is overwork. Because otherwise, we have to go case by case, deep dive into these individual things, and we don't know what workloads means. And if we don't know what overwork means how are individual GAs going to recognize that they're being overworked? Because obviously when they're working 60 hours a week, they're being overworked. If they're being required to be in the lab 60 hours a week, if they're being paid for 13 hours and they're working 25, they're like, oh, there's some wiggle room. But that's still a significant amount of overwork. That is 12 hours, which is what the average GA reported. So let me, let me ask you this. Did you actually, did you survey, did you survey graduate students without appointments? No, I don't think so. We how, would be, how would we have their email? Again, it's, it's more of a rhetorical question. I guess what I'm saying is how you you don't necessarily have a baseline for how much time is being spent by non-employees on their graduate studies. This goes back to one of the statements I had said before about the variation that people spend on their academic work. And I believe that one of the assertions from GAU is that it can be it can be numerically counted exactly. The academic part can be, I mean, in your proposal was that you wanted a straight, strict, rigid multiplier based on registration hours and credits. And I had said and offered that I don't believe we think that student A and student B are going to spend exactly the same amount of time in the same academic pursuits based on, you know, their aptitude, their ability, how focused they are, you know, their work habits, their study habits, all that kind of stuff. But if you draw a straight equal sign and then you just remove the academic portion and say, well, then everything else must be work. We're never going to agree to that. And yet, I also said already that our survey separated academic and employment work. So, if in people a were in a self-reported fashion, in a self-reported fashion, that's the only way we're going to get surveys from several hundred people. Our self-report too. Yeah. Then where are they? What I'm saying is that it's no less reliable. They're both mediums are self-report. I think. I think taking a step back originally, you know, there was. If, if I remember correctly, you you guys gave the first proposal for distinguishing the yes, academic work. Absolutely. We are we are work we want to, you know, and as we were discussing here, obviously we have uh different viewpoints of what like overwork generally means because mm -hmm. it's not clear. But I think that we have to 
and speaking on a grievance, uh, like on uh, everyone being overworked and applying all those grievances, is that, you know, at, and as Austin has mentioned too, is that when there's not a clear distinction, it's hard to bring, you know, it's very difficult to bring those grievances because then at that point, a lot of the stuff that was already in his contract, like being able to have the like department show like what their assigned workloads are, like what they're expecting, what the students assigned workloads are. Yeah. Some of that stuff that was already in here is what would have would need to happen in all those grievances cases to determine if they're being overworked or not. And that and, and right now in our current con contract language, that would have to be done on a case by case basis. And I think what we're trying to work towards here is being able to distinguish that globally for everyone. So at least make that much more clear for how those workloads go. I don't think I don't think we're like on completely separate playing fields on distinguishing that. We both have a shared interest in distinguishing it. And I think that we should continue to work towards that. But you know, and I and what art and what Austin said about Article 10 is that, well, if there's workload. If there is high workload that isn't being addressed with this academic work, well, we would want to be pushed to be paid to increase the minimum stipend even more to compensate for a lot of the overwork that's not being addressed. So that's kind of where all that philosophy is coming into now to work together to, instead of having to push these or try to solve this issue in a different way to actually solve this workload distinction issue so we can both move forward. Yeah, I think just one second. I was responding, and then absolutely you can go. I, I think our our shared interest based on the contract is we don't want GAs working more than 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. That's what the contract requires. Right. We don't want to contemplate, oh, but they're doing it anyway, so we want to address that. I think our shared mutual interest by the contract language is we don't want them working more than 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. That's what... I mean, that's what we both agree. Right, to. right. So then in that case, then, sorry. All right, we'll, 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 you can go ahead. All right. Just, just on that, just replying to that, then wouldn't it be in your interest to then still try to you know, work with us to distinguish his workload? Because that kind of, cause that's why I'm just trying to push here because you just came yeah. to us and said, we're not like, we don't, we we just want to keep CCL. We, we're not going to ever it's, agree. It's, it's, it's not that we don't agree that we want to address it. I think the how we address it is where we are so far apart. And when, when oftentimes when you're not able to, to grapple with the how, the default is you go back to current contract language. I'm not saying we don't want to address it. What I'm saying is when you have a provision that talks about um, you know, some of the things that you all contemplated in your provision, again, the, the predeterminating, the predetermination of a grievance outcome that results in a cash settlement, like, it's just not something we're, we're ever likely to agree to. Where is this at? Where is the predetermination? Uh, number one, if it's determined that the employees assigned FTE is not in compliance with Article 7.1, the university will, one, pay for additional hours already worked on a prorated basis. Wouldn't I mean, that's... That, wouldn't that be determined from... The, Right. No, it's it's telling you what the outcome is. Yeah, and that's language that's taken from pretty much every other contract that we found on the same level that we are. But I, I don't want to I don't want to keep adding yeah. more things until Jake gets it. I was going to say what he wants to say. Going to underscore what Brandon has been saying that it's in our mutual interest. I've heard you say that you don't think it's like literally possible that people could be doing twelve hours over their work, and you mentioned that some of the testimonials seemed like. They were conflating academic work mm -hmm. with so you don't think that like this amount of overwork could be happening you suspect that at least in a couple of cases of the testimonial it's because they're not understanding the distinguishing thing between what they're paid for work and what they're not paid for work um you've also said that you only want people to work 20 hours mm -hmm. all of that means there needs to be more clarity on how these two things are distinguished. So it sounds like we all still have mutual interest in getting more clarity in how to distinguish these. If both times now you've mentioned this bullet point C. If that's what you have an issue with, why didn't you just strike bullet point C? Why did you strike 7.4, 7.2 in its entirety? Um, what used to be 7.3 in its entirety. It seems counter to what is a mutual interest of ours. 
I think we appreciate that the goal is to make sure people are not doing overwork. And I think we're on the same page there that overwork is happening and we don't want people to work more than their current contract language or than their FTE. But I think we're on different sides where we recognize that current contract language is not working. And returning to current con contract language, I mean, we can grieve for the next several years about this, but this is our one chance in three years where we can actually make strides to solve this problem at the source and make corrections instead of having to continue to live with the problem for the next three years. And that's yeah. why I also, I kind of disagree with your statement that you make these gradual changes to the contract, because if we were talking about this every six months and making changes and identifying problems and solving them, great. This is the only time our team is going to be working yeah. on this. And the only time for the next three years that we're going to have a chance to make significant progress on that. And so it's, it's gradual in the long span in the terms of decades and making these things. But I think we We've identified a very serious issue, and it's very difficult for us to go back to current contract language and we understand that that is not working. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And it's and it's like it's not like Article Ten. We're not bargaining this every year. And I think, yeah, and I think it is important to just you know. And I understand you're, you you made some contentions about like you know the outcome of the grievance process, process and things like that. But you know that's. That's kind of like why we're bargaining and we're going through with this. So I think it's important we continue to work on this. And I understand we're we have very different viewpoints, you know, seemingly right now. But I mean, we have this shared interest that will only benefit both the university and us. So I think we should. Yeah, I mean, we're not we're not we're not putting this across the table mm -hmm. and saying, well, this is what it has to be. Yeah, but, but, saying, but it yeah. kind of seems we need to say, you know, you, when you kind of came off of it the first time, we just cross everything out. We don't think we're going to, you know, you said we, we don't think we're going to agree since we have such different viewpoints on this. It yeah. kind of it, it made it seem like you're just not wanting to continue bargaining for this article. That's all. No, That's we're, 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 we're willing to continue to talk about the interest. Okay. And we're willing to talk about solving the problem. I, I tried to lay out the way we'd like to solve the problem, which is to prevent okay. people from working outside their contract. Of course. Mm -hmm. yes. We want to prevent people from working outside their contract. We do too. We don't want to create a situation in which if it's systemic and people are doing it repeatedly, we don't want to encourage them to do it repeatedly and then create this other part of the contract where we say, well, we're just going to have everybody overwork. And then these are the ways we're going to address it in a systematic operationalized way. We want to stop people from working more than what they're supposed to work. Yeah. I, th I think it's best that we move on. For yeah, but I, but I think, I think you know, you know, we understand that. And just, just want to clarify that, you know, going forward, we still want to work on this article. And, and, yeah, well, I'm, we're, okay. we're interested to see what you guys bring next. Okay. All right. Next, we will do, what do we got here? We got 21. I'm going to have to get going in probably 15 minutes or so. So if someone wants to hop on the Zoom so I can transfer once we get to that point. But I can do it. But we have a couple of things to me. So what? I need a pass. That's break. one package. Yeah. That's one package. Oh, okay. okay. That's you know, very interesting. But then yeah. I can take over. Okay. Sounds good. Well, we'll see there you go. These are, it's, it's a couple of pages. So. Okay. All right. Um. Okay, it's just one more. Yeah, I think we were. I think we were really close on this one. Yeah, I think it was just the the notification. Of yeah, the time of yeah. So if you want to turn to line, uh, it starts at really line forty five, which is like the next, uh, page. But yeah, down at line forty two, you'll see what I did was I added a twenty one point three and gave investigation a heading. So that language is the same, but what I then did was I split apart written notice, meaning employees, and this, the language basically is the same. Employees shall receive a written notice of the allegation being investigated. Such notice shall be delivered in person through the United States mail using a first class postage pay an envelope against yeah. the employees. That's, that's pretty much the same. And then B, employees may be placed on administrative leave during the investigation at the university's discretion. The paid leave is not subject to the provision of our aid. Employees must be provided written notice at the time they are placed on administrative leave. So what we tried to do is separate basically what amounts to the charge letter, which is when you're notified of being placed on an investigation, which may or may not be accompanied by admin leave. And if over and above the fact that you're being investigated, you're also placed on admin leave, you need a dedicated communication to that effect. Does that capture it effectively, Rob? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I and so we did talk about, I just want to clarify for the written notice. Do you could you I know we went back and forth and I wasn't hundred percent sure yeah. about what's included. Could you can you give me like a comprehensive view of like what the 
like a typical written notice would include like about the allegations and things like that. Yeah. You said before that there you don't usually include that and you just say you're on pending investigation, like you're on leave. I just I'm just not sure like what that There's two different things. The yeah. administrative leave letter, if one is given just as you're being put on yeah. leave pending further review, right? Yeah. And then if there's an investigation prior to um investigation like commencing right fully starting they would provide the individual um with notice saying been uh, allegations made that you were engaged in disruptive behavior in violation okay. of uf regulation 1.008 okay. um it, it may provide you know, more detail like we're not going to go really far down but you know okay disruptive behavior in your lab at <laughs> the stadium, whatever it okay. may be, you know, there'll be enough okay. there so that the person should have some general sense of so, what they need right. to be prepared to respond to questions to when it's spoken right. to. So regarding just the administrative leave itself, that written notice would not include any of that. It would just be your own paid leave and right. paid admin leave right. pending right. the investigation. Yeah. Okay. Does it contemplate access to like email and stuff like that? Is that listed? In yeah, because you know the in the admin leave letter. Yeah, the admin leave letter. The only other thing would say that you know you're not expected to engage in kind of work activities during this right. time. Right. I mean, because there is there is the issue that Jacob brought up last time regarding twenty one point four that. You know, depending on the disciplinary action in that case, they may not have access to your official university email right. to be able to see that. So maybe it should be delivered both through the mail and in person, or sorry, both delivered through the mail and through email every single time and not have the award. So that's just wondering if that, do they usually lose access? Is that something that may be no, needed? I mean, unless there's some concern for um, safety or security, no one's going to lose, no one's Okay. Well, then I guess at that point it would be on the university to make sure they're properly notified. Of that. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we take that seriously. We'll go to the okay. to make sure that it, it's done correctly. Yeah. In, the, in those rare instances, it's a company okay. owned by an in person meeting. Typically, it is. Yeah. And, and so you can make them both. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. Oh, I'm on really your co host right now, but I can make you host before I have to head out. I think the co host would. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I think I think we're all right. I think I understand with that. Um, I know I when I I proposed it to to include like I include the allegations being investigated. That wouldn't be to be administrative leave. Um, I know you did. I mean, the title of this section is investigation, so that right. would include both the admin leave and the investigation. Mm -hmm. Like, so I don't know if um that language should be included just to clarify that. But I understand like. Where it's going, right? I think we're, you know, we can just we can discuss in committee if there's any changes needed. But I think we're pretty we're pretty good, and everything else is kept the same. Yeah, the intention was that was I think that was the only thing that was addressed. I mean, right. you could check it against the previous version, but I don't think there's any other changes. Yeah, no, I it looks, it looks good. Because yeah, I we'll think you saw I changed I changed oral to verbal reprimand, but I think yeah we, we, we agreed last on time. yeah we were good on that. Okay, that was good. All right, so. Last one we have for you today is 13. Yeah. It's all one. I'm sorry, I came back like kind of mid discussion. So you were saying you don't want to change it to. Right now, it could be just the employee's official university. Right. So what I so what I said was I brought I just I was talking about I brought it up you that you you brought that up last time, um and you said that uh that you know if they usually don't lose access but if they do it would be on the uh, university to make sure they're properly notified. It's very rare. That yeah. You, you yeah. Yeah. So I mean, um, I mean, if we if we end up just I don't see anything in the contract that would make it grievable. Right. I guess in the sense that, like, for example, say, like, I'm I'm an employee, I get disciplined, I immediately lose access to my email because of that before I even get, like, the note, before I even read the notification that I, disciplinary action is in place. Right. The contract says 
or so you, you only have to notify through the, you know, the employee's official email mm -hmm. and it's not grievable that I was never notified of like the the action because I can't access my email to see it. For so example. there may be situations so where yeah. you, know, you put on an administrative leave because you compromise the security right. of or even uh, even this disciplinary action. Right? So we would take immediate action to kind of maintain right. the status quo and that could include preventing future harm by disabling the data link. Just that stuff is very fluid and things move fast right. in these types of situations. So you may get an admin leave letter and you're not going to get a leave a notice of investigation for a week, two weeks, because right. things are happening behind of course, the scenes. Of course. So they're not going to be like here's one but, and the other at the same course. time. Okay. So well, I, I I understand that, but I think it's most really it's just a very specific concern about if if they lose access to their email before they can actually read the email, the, the detailing their discipline, the administrative leave, the investigation, whatever the communication is, that the current contract language would not let that be grievable to say that like, oh, well, I've never been notified of admin leave or the investigation or the disciplinary action because I lost access to my email and in oh, the yeah. email. So that it's really just that very specific case that, that right. happens. And in, in the current, the language as it's proposed now would not make that grievable because you technically you follow the contract. You said, you know, either through the mail or the employee's official university email. That's really the step right. very specific case. And we cut off your email and then we send it to your email that you yeah. access. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of thing. It's yeah. Obvi obvious. Would never ever receive yeah. a written note, right. especially if it was termination or the yeah. outcome. Right. And it was frozen at the beginning. Yeah, so it's conceivable that maybe you do. And yeah, that's what, what I, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's that, it's that we'll put it in the mail would, and would yes, that be okay? You know, we I know there was some that's issue. What we did for, for. Okay, hey, thanks. Just putting the striking that putting in. Okay, all right, thanks for that. Yeah, and just, just, it, I, I mean, I'm sure it probably it's never really happened, but you know, if in case it does happen, just make sure it's reasonable, you know. Yeah, I think, but. I, I think we're in I don't think y'all are so, disciplining enough people that send in a letter. Yeah. 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 But yeah. we're not we're not we're not like quiet terminating people either. Right. We're like like what happened? I didn't even got a notice. What do you right. mean you fired me? Like it that would never be intentional. It just seems like if we're putting like the procedure, why not say and so make sure it's, we're covering all our bases? The and is between in person and mail, right? Because you don't you don't need them to give it in person and also mail it. Like what's the process? Here? Yeah, right. I agree with that. If it's a, in person, it should be sufficient. Yeah. If not that, then mail and email. Okay. However, you would like to write it, it can't just be email. Yeah. Our right. concern. In person or mail and email. I will rework that. Do you have any commas in the right place? Oxford or, or no? Or no comma at all. Oxford or no. Which style guide are we using? Version nine, version 10. All right. Um, all right, 13. Mm -hmm. So a significant portion of what we're bringing to you today is actually what we've stricken. I mean, you probably already can see that the overall majority of your proposed language we've actually stricken. Um, but we'll go ahead and, and go through it here. Uh, 13.1 policy, um, the addition of and UFFGAU, I believe that was actually your addition. Um, so what we have in this first section is we have eliminated the CCL, not all of it, but we've eliminated the entire list of protected classes in favor of what matches exactly the UF regulation. Um, one of the things that we are not interested in doing is creating different standards for different employee groups. And all of it is gonna funnel back to our obligations that are explained in the UF reg. So that is the kind of the overarching sort of philosophy that you're going to see in our response to your proposal. Um, what do you mean by that? I'm sorry. I'm not, so I'm we don't want to have like one standard of discrimination for like this group of employees and a different standard of discrimination for this group of employees and a different standard of discrimination for this group of employees. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So, so I understand what you're saying. I don't agree, but I understand what you're saying. Okay. Um, the other thing, uh, it, the current contract language is still there or any other category protected by applicable federal or state law. Um, the limit, I think you, the limit personal decisions will be based solely on job related criteria and performance. We are not in favor of, uh, of that word because there are times that we have to make personnel decisions that aren't related on job 
related criteria of performance and are not inherently discriminatory. You can't just say that just because this isn't job related, that it's discriminatory. And that's what we think that the inclusion of the word solely there. Can you give me an example of what no, of a case that would make for that? Too. Sure. I mean, so let's say that we have somebody who engages in um, behavior that results in them being, or some of the examples we talked about, Robert, let's say somebody was engaged in behavior that they got them trespassed from the university campus. That's not necessarily job related. That's not job related. I mean, I feel they're like they wouldn't be able to do to their performance would, would suffer if they weren't allowed on campus. So that would be job related because they couldn't perform their job. What if it was during a football game? From the office of, in a, in a random building, but if the laptops or money out of someone's wallet. Like on their personal time, not during work time? Well, yeah. I mean, think about something, let's say... So, but at a football game, you're not you're not acting in an employee capacity when you're at a football game, right? But but under but as an employee of the university, if you were to act in a way that it kind of violates the policies and things like that, you would still be subject to you know to the reprimand, right? Like, I mean, man, I think we would I think we would accept that. I'm not so sure that's consistent with your contract. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm just curious. Like, I'm just well, I'm just kind of going off the example, yeah. right? It just does it just because so you like, you're trying to say that like you know they're because we put for for justifying removing uh, solely here. That that's the ending off the example you gave. So like if they're not at the you know if you're at a football game, you're not there in a in a as an employee capacity. Mm -hmm. So whatever you do would be you know, whatever issues you, you cause, I guess you would say would be on a completely personal level and not job related. Is that what you're saying? Like no, we're saying that that's why we don't want it to say solely because okay. we believe we would like to be able to write to say, look, we know you were just here as a you were just here as a member of the John Q public. You weren't necessarily here as an employee, but you created a massive disturbance. You wound up getting drunk okay. and getting arrested. Okay. We believe we retain the right to say right. even though you weren't here as an employee participating in an employee function. All right. That makes it a lot and now you've been Passed, and we want we don't want to be your employer anymore. Okay, that makes and that we don't believe that's discriminatory. You may not like that we did it, but that's different than it being discriminatory. Okay, that's that's fine. yeah. Um, so, um, this the whole section on thirteen two. Um, in addition, even if not illegal, acts are prohibited if they discriminate against any university community member through inappropriate limitation of access to. I mean, this is all language that's it's it goes so far beyond and is not it is not consistent with the way that our regulations lay out how we treat this. And, and we're just not interested in creating all this additional language and responsibility on the part of the university. Um, we know that we've we spent a lot of time and you presented on the uh, the bathroom issue. At, at this point, we are not interested in any provisions having to do with um, bathroom access inside the um, inside the contract. Why is that? Um, because we believe that it's it's our responsibility to maintain our building facilities and to provide uh, to provide the facilities to our employees. We don't believe that's a substantive mandatory subject of bargaining. We believe it's a management right to organize our buildings, lay out our buildings, maintain our facilities, and have them operate in a safe, orderly environment. And we're not going to bargain that. We're not interested in bargaining that. Um, when you get to 13.4, sexual harassment. Um, sexual harassment is defined by federal law as a prohibited form of sex discrimination. The university strictly prohibits sexual harassment as defined in, or as defined by university regulation and policy and relevant state and federal laws. Again, this is what I had said before. We have explicit regulations and policies on these things. We want to defer to the one that covers the entirety of the organization, not a separate one that we're gonna bargain with you that may be different from what's in place in another group or in another group. Well, if you're gonna keep mentioning that, so you're changing current contract language. So, we, you already have bargained something different. Yes. Some, yes. And some workers may not be unionized, may not have bargaining rights. Mm -hmm. Why would you expect that there would be the exact same level of protection when bargaining has already produced 
differing levels of protections. And now you're trying to go to uh, reach, change our contract to have less specificity and pointing towards a law that already applies. So therefore, like it's, re it's moving all the responsibility over to what you're already legally obligated to have as a protection by the law. Right. So why are you not only like rejecting tons of the additions we've made, but actually trying to whittle away current contract language on that protects from discrimination, saying that the degree of protections that we have already previously bargained, you're not interested in us having that level of protection. You, it should all be the bare basic level that you're legally obligated to do. Well, it's not it's not just what we're obligated to do. It's also what the board has approved for the entirety of the organization. It's not, and I agree, yeah, it is a change. We don't want to be administering separate policies that are extremely nuanced and and complicated. We don't want them to be different. Our interest is in actually bringing them all together so that they're similar. Yeah, it is a change. I'm not saying it's not a change. It is a change. That's our interest. Our interest is in bringing them all consistent. So you're citing then that we should chip away at current protections against unlawful discrimination because it's too much work for the university to juggle no, I, separate I think, I think standards for unlawful discrimination? I think you're making the assumption that our regulations and policies are insufficient. I, I'm, not, I'm not agreeing with that. I'm not agreeing that our regulations and policies are insufficient. I'm just saying they're different. You said you're using words like chip away as if there's there's rights or protections. Because right being now, uh, the current contract language in our contract gives us graduate assistance protections against discrimination. Yes. And if we revert that to what is already provided by law and university policy, we're surrendering what is currently enshrined in our bargaining contract as a result of bargaining mm -hmm. for something that already applies to everyone at this university, whether by regulation or by law or something. So that is, in a literal sense, chipping away at protections that we currently have for something that does not depend on our contract. So I guess what I'm taking issue with is your, your statement, your belief that the way that it's described in your contract is in some way, shape, or form better than what's in our policies and regulations. I will acknowledge it's different. I don't think it's necessarily better. I think I'm also not interested in defining our contract as based off of your regulations and policies that UFGU does not have any say in uh, keeping standard or protecting. What's stopping University of Florida from changing that? And then our contract would still be valid because you've changed your regulations and policies. I think we want concrete protections that will last the next several years that expand upon what I I consider, and maybe it's not the opinion of UFJU as a whole, insufficient in several different ways. Okay. Um, I'm very unfortunate to have to leave at this point, um, but I should be able to pass it on to you. You'll have to share your screen on Article 13. I will. Um, um, in that case, as you know, Austin was... Yeah. the main person who um, worked on a lot of this. And so we may, um, you know, like the the discussion might be lacking and we might have to just with our next. You want to start with, yeah. we can start next session with going through this if you want. I'd be interested in that so I could be present for the discussion. That's fine. If we're okay with that. Would, we don't mind. And you get a couple minutes early and let's holding just, off on that. If everyone's good with that, let's just yeah. end early. Okay. I'm fine with that. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All. Uh, yeah, let me make sure the host. Um, I should be able to leave.